Thank you, PJ. And it's a pleasure to be here at Wheaton College. Um, I visited Wheaton College, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago um, and, uh, and, and did a bit of lecturing at that time. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be back um, at Wheaton College and a pleasure to address all of you. It looks like there's about 50 people here to hear this talk on how same-sex marriage affects everyone. Now, um, I want to open by asking that you seriously consider praying for the institution of marriage and working that into your prayer life, that the definition of marriage is being challenged really worldwide. It's not just across the United States, but also around the world. Um, so in places as, as far flung as Argentina and Australia, people are talking about redefining marriage or, or Ha already have done so. So I'd ask you to keep this um, intention in your prayers. But at the same time, I want you to be encouraged about marriage, about the issue of marriage, because when marriage comes before the people, the people inevitably vote to preserve marriage as the union of one man and one woman. And not only are we seeing that in referendum, uh, where there have been 31 referenda across the country in different states, and in each and every case where people have the opportunity to vote on the definition of marriage, they vote for marriage as the union of one man and one woman. At the constitutional level, at the statutory level, marriage has not lost at that level. But even now in some state legislatures, in places where people thought that uh, marriage would be redefined by the state legislature, um, the, that, that has not happened. That has not happened in the, in the way that people expected it to happen. So very recently, uh, both in the st uh, state of Maryland and in the state of Rhode Island, uh, people were elected into office with the idea that this is going to be our top priority to redefine marriage, bring in same-sex marriage into our state, and that has not happened. They have not had the votes for it. So I, I want you to feel encouraged by that, that, that the fact that there, there is still an understanding that marriage is the union of a man and a woman, um, and that um, that's what we're here to talk about tonight, is why that should be the case. Now, I'm, I'm inviting people to sign up for the Ruth Institute newsletter. The Ruth Institute promotes lifelong married love to college students and other young adults by trying to create an intellectual and social climate that's favorable to marriage. And so same-sex marriage is really um, one of many issues that we deal with, and in, in a sense, probably my least favorite thing to talk about. Um, we have the whole hookup culture to deal with on a lot of college campuses. Of course, that's a big deal. It's not a big deal here at Wheaton, presumably, but, um, but it's a big deal at some of the college campuses that I go to. Um, we worry about the issue of divorce, cohabitation, uh, all of those types of issues that impinge on marriage, we deal with that. Um, and so if you go to the Ruth Institute website, Site, go to ruthinstitute.org or you go to the ruthblog.org, you'll see us talking about all of these issues and being in dialogue on all of those kind of issues and trying to present solid social science evidence uh, for why the traditional teachings of really all the Christian faiths um, have been, are being vindicated really by science. So um, what I'd like to do to, with you tonight is, as advertised, the title of this talk is that same-sex marriage affects everyone. Now, why would I pick a title like that? Um, it's because we very often hear that, um, what's the harm in redefining marriage? What's, what's the big deal about re redefining marriage? How does it affect you if your neighbors uh, have a marriage that consists of people of the, of the same sex? What difference does it make? And if, if in your mind you can't really figure out that if there's any problem with it, then people are kind of inclined to say, well, you know, why not let them have it? You know, what's the big deal? So what I want to do with this evening is to kind of go through some of the, some of the reasons why um, something will happen. There, there are things that are gonna happen and that deserve to be thoroughly aired and thoroughly talked about. But the first thing I feel free to talk about here at Wheaton College, being one of the great evangelical colleges of the United States, is to just mention what it means for you as religious believers, or I should say for us as religious believers. The scriptures are full of marriage. I want you to just notice that, that the Bible opens with the Garden of Eden where God creates marriage, right? God institutes marriage as the first human social institution, the first society is after God creates the animals and the earth and the plants and creates man and woman, then he gives them to one another and talks about he creates marriage there in the Garden of Eden. And the Bible ends in Revelation with the wedding feast of the Lamb. 
And in between Genesis and Revelation, there is nuptial imagery all through the Bible. All through, we hear about God loving his people the way a bridegroom loves his bride. All through, we hear about uh, whether, the, whether the people are faithful or not faithful, as a bride should be to her, to her groom. We hear all of this nuptial imagery. We also hear gender-based imagery, that God is not a generic parent. God is our father, right? And um, we, we have to believe that when God created us male and female in the first place, and then presents himself to us in the male form, that he didn't just do that at random. That was more than a coin toss. God's trying to say something to us by having gendered imagery, that gender itself has some theological significance. Now, I'm not gonna go through and talk about all of the theology of the human body and why it's significant. I just wanna point this out to you, that if we lose the ability to talk about marriage in our terms in the public square, we will lose the ability to evangelize. We will lose the ability to preach the gospel. That if you can't talk about marriage, in biblical terms, you are losing a huge part of the gospel message. And so as Christian believers, the idea that the state should take control of what marriage means and redefine it from something that it has always meant, that is something that will have an impact on all of us as religious believers. And indeed, I could do a whole talk on different ways in which uh, the redefinition of marriage has been impinging on people's religious liberty. But that's not the main thrust of my talk tonight. I just wanted to start with that for you to, to see right, off, right off, off, uh, out of the chute that there's something significant here and worth worrying about. Now, I noticed that in the last week or so, you had a speaker here called Wesley Hill. And I don't know if any of you were present at Wesley Hill's um, uh, uh, talk. Um, I read his book, and I think it's a marvelous book. And, and I really respect what he has done there. And one of the things that I want to emphasize before I say <clears throat> anything else is that nothing that I will talk about tonight is in any way disparaging towards people who experience same-sex attraction. That is, I am not going to make an argument about marriage that's based on uh, that somehow gay people are not worthy of marriage or that there's something wrong with them or that they're gonna ruin it or something like that. There's no, th nothing like that. That's not what this is about. It's not about purpose of marriage and what is the meaning of marriage. And I think that you'll find that um, if you read the things that I've written, listen to my podcasts, listen to my speeches, you'll see that I don't spend, I don't spend five minutes talking about what I think about gay people. It's just not something I care about. Um, and, it, and it goes without saying in my mind that, um, that uh, People who experience same-sex attraction, whether they're male or female, whether they're actively participating in, um, in same-sex sexual activity, all of those people are loved by God, and all of those people have immeasurable human dignity, and Christ died for each one of them, and therefore that's just not on the table as far as I'm concerned. That's just not even is an issue. My, what I want to focus on is the consequences of redefining marriage. Some of, of these consequences I'll talk about I believe are unintended. I believe some of these are unintended consequences. On the other hand, I think some of the things I'm gonna talk about actually are intended. Uh, uh, and, and part of the reason I say that is that the people who advocate for same-sex marriage, there's a big group of them, right? And they don't all have the same thoughts and feelings and motives. They don't all, they're not all on the same page. Just like there are a lot of people who believe marriage is a man and woman, there are a lot of people who think marriage should be redefined. Um, and they have a lot of different thoughts and feelings. So. What I'm going to do, what I'm going to try to do is give you what I think is the, um, is a clear picture of what I think will happen and whether people intend that to happen or don't intend that to happen, and we'll leave that for another time or to try to figure out. So I want to start by asking a very, what I think is the most basic question. Before we talk about redefining marriage and changing one of its most basic traditional characteristics, namely the gendered characteristic, right, that marriage is the union of a man and a woman, and that two gender requirement is, is important. Um, before we talk about that, we have to ask ourselves, well, what is the purpose of marriage? Why do we have marriage in the first place? What is the essential public purpose of marriage? That's what I want to start with. What is the essential public purpose of marriage? Now, I contend that the essential public purpose of marriage is to attach mothers and fathers to their children and to one another. The essential 
public purpose of marriage is to attach mothers and fathers to their children and to one another. Now, I want to contrast this essential public purpose with inessential private purposes. All right, so if we ask, what is your private purpose in getting married? Why do you in particular want to get married? Well, you could have a whole laundry list of reasons of why somebody in particular might want to get married. You might want to get married because you want to get out of your parents' house. You might want to irritate your previous boyfriend. You might want to have the nice dress. You might want to have the big party. You might think that there's some kind of health insurance benefits you're going to get. There could be all kinds of private, personal reasons why you in particular would want to get married. But please notice, none of those, individually or taken together, add up to a reason, a public reason, why you should have marriage in the first place. None of those reasons amount to a reason why a society would create something like marriage in the first place. The fact that I want the nice dress just doesn't play into it, right? So those are inessential purposes, and those are private purposes. Right, that's what I'm saying there. Now the other sense in which the purpose I name is a essential purpose is that if it weren't for this purpose, I don't think we would have marriage at all. I don't think we would need marriage if it weren't for this essential purpose. It's essential in that way. So just let's do a little thought experiment. Let's suppose we were the type of creatures that reproduced with, uh, that didn't do sexual reproduction. Okay, we we're like amoeba and we divide or something. Right, okay. Well, if, so, so, so now we have asexual reproduction. Okay, so there's no point in marriage if you don't have sexual reproduction. There's no point in it. Or, or suppose we were the type of creature that produced bisexual reproduction, but um, uh, our young were born alive and ready to function all on their own. You know, the baby snakes get born. There's a mother snake and a father snake, but the babies are born and they just slither away. They don't really need parents, right? So there's not much call for pair bonding in the reptile kingdom as far as I have ever heard, right? So pair bonding, marriage, right, is something that flows out of the biology of, of uh, sexual reproduction plus the long period of dependence of the young on their parents. If it weren't for that, I don't suppose anyone would have ever thought of the idea of lifelong sexually exclusive partnering, right? You wouldn't need it, it wouldn't enter your mind to create something like that. So that's the sense in which I say that this is the essential public purpose of marriage. It's essential in the sense that if it weren't for that purpose, you wouldn't need marriage in the first place. There'd be no point to it, okay? So why am I spending so much time on that? Because I think that defining that purpose of marriage is crucial to understanding how the legal battles are playing out. I have noticed that in court in court cases where the courts say that, um, that, yes, this is the essential public purpose of marriage, where they say, yeah, there's an important, pro important procreative purpose of marriage, um, th those courts inevitably hold that it's perfectly legitimate for the state to require a, a male-female requirement. That, it's, that, that there's, it's not discrimination to say that uh, marriage requires a man and a woman, and that same-sex couples are not being wrongly excluded because the essential, the essential purpose, namely the procreative, in some form, is, the courts say this in a variety of different ways. They have a variety of different formulae that they use, but they're coming to the same sort of thing, that where the courts say, yes, this is one of the essential purposes of marriage, then, you can, then it's clear that a same-sex couple and an opposite-sex couple are situated differently with respect to that purpose. So if you're situated differently with respect to that important purpose, it's not discrimination to treat people differently, right? If it's, if it's in fact, if you are situated differently with respect to that purpose, then it's, th th there's nothing unlawful about treating people differently in that situation. It is only when courts say, no, this is not an important purpose of marriage, that is when the courts will say, no, the Constitution requires same-sex marriage. Where courts have said that, the con that it is unlawful discrimination to say that marriage is only a man and a woman, in those cases, the courts have always redefined the purpose of marriage. And I'll, I will give you an example, that, which is really the most recent example, from the Proposition 8 case that took place 
um, that, as you probably know, Proposition 8 is in the courts, is in the federal courts right now. And last August, the federal judge uh, ruled that the requirement that, that there be a man and a woman in a marriage, that that was unlawful discrimination. That was Judge Vaughn Walker um, in, a, in a federal district court out in California, and he overturned Proposition 8. He said Proposition 8 violates the federal constitution. That's what, the, that's what was the subject of that case. Well, so in order to do that, what did he say was the definition of marriage? I want to read to you what he said was the purpose of marriage. He says this, marriage is the state recognition and approval of a couple's choice to live with each other, to remain committed to one another, and to form a household based on their own feelings about one another and to join in an economic partnership and support one another and any dependents. So if you listen to that definition, there's nothing in it about sexual exclusive exclusivity. There's nothing in there about procreation. There's nothing in there even about sex. This doesn't have to be a sexual relationship. In fact, some of you kids uh, could make this definition with your roommates by the end of the semester, you know. So this definition of marriage is not really what we would think of as marriage, right? There's the purpose, the procreative purpose is not even on the list. It's not just that it has moved down the list, it's off the list, okay? It's completely off the, he's not even talking about the idea that the purpose of marriage, that there might be a, an essential purpose of marriage that has to do with attaching mothers and fathers to their children and to one another. And that's the way, that's what he has to say in order to say that same-sex and opposite-sex couples are similarly situated with respect to the purposes of marriage. Are you with me here? You see what he's, you see what he's doing? So it's not just that it gets downgraded. Not, he's not just saying it's one of many purposes. It's not the most important purpose anymore. It's not even on his list. Of purposes, and that pattern is repeated in the Iowa Supreme Court, where also the court said that uh, same-sex marriage was required by the Constitution. So, if you start with that and understand that this is that that this is what's at stake, is that there is an essential public purpose to marriage, which is being defined out of existence in the process of redefining marriage. That's what gives rise to the thought that there's going to be some problems with redefining marriage. It isn't simply making things equal, right? It's not simply treating people with respect. That's not all that's at stake here. I believe that what's at stake here is that same-sex marriage will undermine some key principles of law and social practice. I think there are some key principles that of law and social practice that we currently more or less take for granted. Some of them are under attack and from other dimensions, but they're still important key principles, and that that, by undermining those principles, that that is going to have a negative effect on society. So let me go through some of those principles and explain what I think the consequence will turn out to be. The first key principle is that children are, generally speaking, entitled to a relationship with their mothers and their fathers. Children are, generally speaking, entitled to a relationship with their mothers and fathers. Now, if you think about how marriage law is structured, the idea of marriage is that for every child, there is a mother and a father. Now, generally, the mother part is pretty simple. There are some complications coming up due to artificial reproductive technology, but for the most part, when a baby is born, there's usually a mother somewhere close by. Right, and you know who the mother is. The social problem is to attach the father. Figure out who the father is and attach the father. Now the way that marriage has traditionally done that is to say that if a woman is married, any children born to her during the life of her union will be automatically considered to be the, the children of her husband. That's called the presumption of paternity, that her husband is presumed to be the father of any children that she bears during the life of their marriage. And so what does that mean? If you take that legal presumption and couple it with the strong social presumption of sexual exclusivity, exclusivity inside marriage, what are you doing? You're pretty much tracking biology, right? You're saying that the child belongs to their own mother, biological mother and father. Now we have backup plans to deal with exceptional circumstances such as adoption, but, but with when parents for some reason can't take care of their own child. But the adoption process 
is a child-centered process that exists to give children the parents they need. It does not exist to give adults the children that they happen to want. So the fact that we have some kids being adopted does not really take away from what I'm saying here. Right? The main idea is that marriage is designed to attach mothers and fathers to their children and to one another. Now, what will happen and what is already happening with same-sex unions is that marriage itself will become the kind of thing that actually separates children from at least one of their parents. And the way that is happening is this, that the courts, the family courts now, are starting to interpret the presumption of paternity. They're trying to reinterpret that or redefine that and call it a presumption of parentage. So that if I'm in a same-sex union with another woman and I give birth to a baby, what the advocates for same-sex marriage want, what there's a whole lesbian legal establishment, I guess you could call it, that takes, brings these cases to court, what they would like to do is to say that my same-sex partner is presumed to be the other parent of that child. Now think about that for a minute. It's a sleight of hand going from presumption of paternity to presumption of parentage. But they have completely different implications. In the case of a same-sex union, that other partner, the, the same-sex partner, is never the child's other parent. With zero probability is the other woman the, chi the child's other parent. In order to say that, in order to do that, what you've had to do is to safely escort the father off the stage in some way, and there are legal ways that that's being done, and then attach the child to another woman, okay? And so what looks, what's, what's being created, it's on, on the surface it's neutral or it's equal because it's treating the couples the same, the same sex couple and the opposite sex couple, they're being treated the same, but the child is not being treated the same. The child is in the situation where the institution of marriage is separating them from one of their biological parents and attaching them to somebody who is not their biological parent. And so the institution of marriage itself is treating unequally now children in different kinds of situations and opposite sex parents in some situations, okay? Whereas in, uh, it, it, ordinarily, um, a father has legal responsibility for taking care of a child if they're married, if the marriage ends, the law recognize, still recognizes his paternal rights and re paternal responsibilities. That is being changed, that is being set aside um, here in, the, in this, due to, due to same-sex marriage. So the second principle that um, uh, of, I would say of law, of, not so much of law, but of social practice and social understanding, kind of cultural norms, that same-sex marriage will affect is the idea that mothers and fathers are not, generally speaking, perfectly interchangeable. That mothers and fathers are not perfectly interchangeable. That is, that mothers make unique contributions to the well-being of children, fathers make unique contributions to the well-being of children, and that having two moms or two dads is not the same thing as having a mother and a father. It's very interesting to look at the literature that comes out. I suppose you've heard that there are studies that say that the children of same-sex parents do just fine, okay? A, a lot of times those studies are, are very, very interestingly skewed because what they do is they have a list of parenting behaviors and they ask the question, how much of these parenting behaviors are being done? And of course, the things you put on a list of parenting behaviors usually are mom behaviors, right? Uh, things that moms do, hands-on kind of stuff that moms do. And so it looks like then that mothers do more of things moms do, like helping with homework and, um, and uh, spending time with children and nurturing children and uh, speaking in soft voices and all these kinds of things that end up on these lists of parenting activities. So it looks like mothers are the best parents. And so from that, we have people concluding that two mothers are better than a mother and a father. And I'm not making that up. There, there were at least two different studies that came out that once you look past the headline and looked at what was really there, that's what they were saying. Now, there are a couple of problems with this. Actually, there are many problems with this, but I want to just focus on one for now. And that is that, again, this thing which appears to be neutral, 
with respect to the genders, which appears to be neutral with respect to same-sex and opposite-sex couples, I don't think is going to operate in a neutral way. In other words, when you say mothers and fathers are interchangeable with one another, that's not going to affect moms and dads the same way. What I think will happen, and what I think is already happening, is that it is fathers who will be marginalized from the family. It is fathers who will be disposed of. It is fathers who will be considered not essential. How can I, why do I say that? How, what, what kind of evidence do I have for that? Well, let me just give you a few little, first of all, re refer back to the very first point that I made, which is that when a baby is born, the mother is usually nearby. The attachment of the mother and the child is intrinsically strong. And it's the father that you have to put some effort into attaching. So if you say that mothers and fathers are interchangeable, then what's the point of attaching the father? What's, what's the point of doing that? If you could attach the mother's girlfriend to the mother's friend just as easily, then what's the point? And one of the things that we're seeing is the redefinition of birth certificates, the rewriting of birth certificates. In British Columbia, for example, where if you look at the birth, they have same-sex marriage in, Cal in, uh, in Canada. I don't know if you knew that, but they do. They have same-sex marriage in Canada. And as a result of that, they had to go and redo the birth certificates. They have to figure out, well, okay, we have to be ready to deal with these situations now. And so there's a place for the mother's information. There's a place for the child's information, of course. And then down where the father's information would be, there's a checkoff box. And the checkoff box is you can check off a box that says this person is the father, this person is the co-parent, has agreed to be the co-parent, okay? So motherhood is intact on that document, but fatherhood has become a checkoff box. In the UK, when they um, uh, instituted same-sex marriage, there was a, um, a, a, another kind of collateral change that took place there, that in the UK, you can get uh, artificial reproductive technology, you can get IVF, the use of in vitro fertilization, if you're an unmarried woman, the rule had been, and you get it through their National Health Service, the rule had been that if you were an unmarried woman, you had to sign a statement saying that, um, that your child would have some kind of father figure, okay? Now, that statement, signing that statement, as far as I know, was a kind of a perfunctory thing. I don't think very many people were ever excluded from having their IVF baby because they couldn't produce a, an uncle or something. But it was a requirement, you know, that the state says you need to show us that you're going to, if you're going to use the National Health Service to reproduce in an, an, in an artificial way, we want to know this child will have a father figure. Well, after same-sex marriage, they eliminated even that very perfunctory requirement because, because they said, we didn't want lesbian couples to feel bad. Okay? So that is another bit of evidence about the, uh, that this thing which appears to be neutral is not really going to operate in a neutral way with respect to mothers and fathers. The, the th uh, third issue, the third principle of law and social practice is that biology is the primary way that we define parenthood. Right now, that is the, that's basically what we're trying to do. That the law is simply recognizing that a child has two parents, right? And if you say the word mother and father, the whole human race knows exactly what you're talking about, the mother and the father, the male parent, the female parent. And we're, it, it doesn't, it's not rocket science, it's not that complicated. Little children figure it out when they have their little toy animals, they figure out which is the mother horse and which is the father horse. And everybody, it's completely intelligible what you mean by mother and father you mean the biological male parent, the biological female parent. Now, what is happening in the course of recognizing and legalizing same-sex unions, what is happening is that the principle that biology is the primary way that we determine parenthood and define parenthood, that is being undermined. That is being undermined because now what is happening is that the parent is the mother and whoever else she names, in effect, right? That is her, her partner, or, or, but it actually doesn't have to be just the, I'm using this as the example because it's, it's, it comprises the vast majority of the cases, but it doesn't have to be that, that your partner becomes the other parent, a partner who has obviously no relationship to the, to the child, no biological relationship to the child. And at the same time, what has happened is that the father has been uh, set aside if they, in fact, do an anonymous sperm donor um, kind of situation. Now, I want to just pause right there for a moment 
because there are actually two ways that you can do artificial insemination in principle. There are two ways you could do this. One is you could do it by an anonymous sperm donation. And the law around that is, is already in place. It's well established. But I want you to think about this law and what it's doing, okay? Because this is something that has kind of crept into our culture without people giving it very much thought um, and without really paying attention to what the long-term consequences of it are. But really what's happening is that the law is making it possible for a father to be completely separated from his child. And it's making it possible for a woman to become a parent without ever having a, even a single sexual encounter with another person. And so she is making a decision. When a woman goes to a sperm bank and gets an anonymous sperm donation, she's making a decision that her child will never have a relationship with his father. She's unilaterally making that decision that her child will never have a relationship with his father. And I personally don't think that that's right. That, 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 to, that to say that, we, that a woman has that right because she wants it, that's not enough of a reason. Just because she wants it, that's not enough of a reason. And in fact, it would be impossible to do what she's trying to do without the active participation and assistance of the state. Right? In other words, if the state didn't come in and say that, um, that th this child is a legal stranger to this man who was the sperm donor, nobody would ever get involved in artificial sperm donation. Nobody would do it. Because, and why, now, why do I say that? If you haven't thought this through, you might think, well, she's lost her mind. Why is, she, why is this so obvious to her? But let's think it through, OK? You go and you uh, make a deposit in a sperm bank, and you get your 200 bucks or whatever they're paying for it. Um, and, and you do that with the confidence that the mother and the child are never going to come find you for child support. Right? If you thought they might come after you for child support, you probably wouldn't make the sperm donation for 200 bucks or whatever, right? I mean, that would be a pretty risky proposition. On the other hand, if you're a woman and you want to have a, uh, and you want to have a child without uh, being involved with the father, um, going and making a withdrawal from the sperm bank, um, the only way you're going to do that is if you're sure the guy is never going to show up on your doorstep and demand joint custody. Right, which under normal circumstances, he should and he could, right? So it's the state that has made this radical separation possible, this radical separation of the child from one of their parents. The state has facilitated something. This is completely impossible in the natural order of things, okay? And so, to my mind, the fact that gays and lesbians do it does not bother me as much as the fact that anybody's doing This is something that shouldn't be done. The state shouldn't be doing this. But the problem is, the way same-sex marriage comes into it is that as same-sex couples have demanded this as a right, it is going to be increasingly difficult to retrace our steps from this. And it's not just something that's available to people, it's something that is becoming an entitlement. The use of artificial reproductive technology is becoming more than just sort of available, it's becoming an honest to goodness entitlement. And I don't think anybody has really thought through the full fledged consequences of that. So that's the first pro part of this problem is that you can do it through anonymous sperm donation with all these problems that I'm talking about. The other side of it, though, is that you could decide, well, gosh, we, we, we want our child to have a father. We want our child to be involved with their opposite sex parent. And so, and these cases are, are, are out there. These cases are coming up. In fact, these are some of the ones that you see in family court where the courts have to figure out what to do because the way they go is the lesbian couple that decides, well, we'd like to have a baby and we have uh, Joe over here and he's, we like Joe and maybe Joe's gay and has a gay partner. Maybe he's not. Maybe he's somebody's cousin or, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. But w they have a known sperm donor is the point. And so what they'll try to do is draw up some legal documents that will define their relationship amongst themselves. And then uh, the document doesn't quite cover everything that came up, right? right? You, it's very hard to make a plan like that, right? That says you're gonna be a, you're gonna be a parent, but you're gonna be at arm's length. And we don't want you, we want you involved, but not too involved, right? And to, to make a, a plan like that, it's not surprising a lot of those plans fall apart and end up in court. And so one of the things that people are doing is they're ending up with triple parenting. They're ending up with three names on a birth certificate, three people having legal custody of a child. That's what's happening. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is that this is a serious matter, right? To start from a society where biology is the basic way that you do parenthood, and to now get yourself to a situation where you have three legal parents, that's a big step. 
And how often in the debate over same-sex marriage have you heard anybody talk about that? Very seldom do you hear anybody talk about it. But it deserves to be thoroughly vetted and thoroughly discussed. And when somebody brings it up, it's not proper at all to hoot them down as a bigot or to say that you, you, you just don't like us and that's the reason you're talking about this. Has, that has nothing to do with this. This is a very serious kind of legal and social change that we're setting into motion without thinking through the full consequences of it. And by the way, uh, saying, that, uh, saying that artificial reproductive technology is an entitlement uh, opens up a whole range of things that we aren't even beginning to think about. Right now, we think of it as, oh, the people who go use IVF are uh, people who really love a baby and want to have a baby. But the, the truth is, under, under American law, anybody with money gets to do anything they want. There's no rule that you have to love the baby. Nobody's checking that out, right? And, uh, and so as this thing unfolds, and more and more people do it, and more and more uh, incentives be become discovered and get, and get into place, you're going to have people doing things for not so nice reasons. And so again, I'm not saying that uh, anything about what gays and lesbians are going to do or not do. I'm talking about the legal structures that are being put into place that are going to affect everybody's behavior. Those incentives are going to affect everyone, not just the handful of people who currently describe themselves as gay and lesbian. So I think that this issue of redefining parenthood is quite serious. What's happening is that in the process of redefining marriage, we're also redefining, mar redefining parenthood. But nobody's talking about the redefining parenthood piece. Now this is a little spot, I'm gonna stop and, and say that this is a place where I know for sure that there are some people who intend this outcome. Because you see them writing in law reviews. You see them writing articles in, say, the Boston Globe. The Boston Globe let the cat out of the bag uh, not too long ago with a story about uh, children with four parents. And they wrote, basically, the Boston Globe wrote a puff piece about, isn't this nice, this child has four people who love them, you know, um, and not talking about the complications and the legal meaning of what is going on here. Where this, this group of people, whoever they are, gay, straight, you know, who, whoever they are, there, there's, there's a batch of them out there, and, you know, they don't have all labels on them, but um, where they're headed, I believe, is contract parenting. That is, that parenting... Parenthood is not your identity as the biological mother and father. You know, that, that right now, that's your identity. You're a mother, you're a mother forever. Where they're headed is to a system where adults parcel out parental rights and responsibilities through contracts with one another. And the child is kind of sitting here with a life that is not fully integrated, let us say. Okay, that they're, that they're, somebody's got educational rights, somebody sees the kid every other Tuesday, somebody's got medical rights. That kind of, of disintegration, right, something that should be integrated and all bound up together, that disintegration is what's going to be the outcome for kids. And I, I suspect that the average advocate of gay marriage has no idea about this and doesn't want this. I suspect that's the case. But I know for sure that there are some who do want it, right? And that's, and that's why they're doing it. That's what they're headed for. They tend to be found in law schools. All right. <laughs> I bump into these people <laughs> in law schools and in law reviews. So the final point that I want to make about this, the final uh, legal principle or idea, um, is that currently our understanding is that the state recognizes parenthood and parentage but does not control it and does not assign it. That when the state puts down on the birth certificate mother and father, what the state now is doing is recognizing a pre-existing reality, right? There is, a, there is a natural reality, mother, father, you give birth to the baby in the hospital, nice little lady comes around and says, let's fill out the birth certificate. The state is simply recognizing a truth that's already there. What's happening now is that the state is defining who counts as a parent, who counts as a legal parent. And the biological point is being set aside. Now, one thing that's coming up in the case law as we look at these disputed lesbian custody cases is that the state is being asked to declare somebody a de facto parent. That is, the state knows perfectly well that this woman is not the parent by biology and is not the parent through adoption. And by the way, if there's a second party adoption in a same-sex couple, there's no case because the second party 
who has adopted a child is fully a parent. Okay, so there's, there's never a custody issue there. All these cases have to do with situations where they didn't do a second party adoption and the and person's not biologically related to the child. So the, that the estranged lesbian partner will come into court and say, I want to uh, be declared parent in fact, a de, a de facto parent. And typically in, the, in these cases, um, they're defended by um, um, some of the high profile advocacy law firms. That, that's the kind of case that they like to take. And so what you'll see the courts doing is to say, well, does this person really count as a parent or not? And what they'll do is come up with a set of criteria. Um, did they hold themselves out as a parent? Did they, how much time did they spend with the child? Did the child uh, did the child call them mother or father? Um, did they intend that this be the parent? In other words, all of these things which are subjective and are subject to the interpretation of the court. So what does that mean? That means the court is empowering itself to decide who counts as a parent. Did you wipe enough noses and change enough diapers to count as a parent, in fact? That's what's happening to us. So what does that mean? It means an empowerment an expansion of the state. It means the state expanding its authority into an area that has never been part of its authority before. It's never been under its jurisdiction. And so that, that means that the ability of the state uh, to intervene in the lives of ordinary people is, vastly, is, is going to be vastly expanded. So um, I'd like to, uh, I, but the, the other way in which the power of the state is expanded, is that um, changing from a definition of marriage that's man-woman marriage to same-sex marriage, what you're doing is starting with something that's a natural pre-existing reality. Marriage pre-exists the state, okay? Marriage is not something the state invented. Marriage existed a long time before the Constitution of the United States or any known government, right? This, marriage has existed forever. It's a pre-political institution. Same-sex marriage, by contrast, is entirely a creature of the state. It's entirely created by the state. And so what will have to happen is that the state will have to enforce its understanding of marriage. The state will have to enforce and create a society where everybody accepts and understands that that's what is normal. And the state will have to protect its creature same-sex marriage. It will have to coddle its creature because it's not really going to be able to survive on its own. Every little child who looks at a pair of, of, of uh, mommy and daddy ducks or something is going to think mommy and daddy, right? And th that, that's not really a sufficiently inclusive understanding of, of marriage and parenthood to survive under, these, um, under, under this new understanding or this new dispensation. So what I'd like to do is to is to close by sharing with you something that I put together to kind of describe some of the things that I think could be in store for us. And I did it by kind of making a little story um, about uh, uh, people 30 years from now, people 30 years from now living in the city of Oakland. And I, so I want you to imagine that you are yourself 30 years from now, 40 years from now, and, um, and you have a grandchild, okay? however long it takes you to get that done, okay? Um, and so, <laughs> and so I'll, I'll, just, I'll just share this with you to get an idea of some of the things that I think might be in store for us. So you and your grandson are going to a private prayer meeting at an apartment building in the city of Oakland, California. You've been there often enough that you know a lot of the people who are sitting out on the steps or out in the yard. There's Miss Marisol. Her little girl lives with her some of the time, but when she broke up with her boyfriend, he went to court to claim that he was the de facto parent and that he should have shared custody. He was doing it to be mean to her and because he wanted to have access to the little girl, if you know what I mean. Under the de facto parent law, he counted as a parent because he spent enough time with the child and she used to call him daddy. So Marisol's daughter is with her old boyfriend part time and she really can't do anything about it. She didn't fight too hard because her friend Lisa used to live in the same complex. Lisa got her daughter taken away from her completely. Lisa went into hiding with her daughter when the court ordered her to turn the little girl over to her former girlfriend part time. Somebody to saw her, told on her, and she got found. So her little girl was taken away and Lisa did jail time. So Marisol figured she was better off not fighting with her ex. Then there's Sherry and Rebecca. They're married to each other. 
They don't have sex with each other. They have sex with men, but nobody really cares about that. They each have two kids with different guys, so there are four kids there with four different dads, which actually means no dads. They each raise their kids, their own kids, under the same roof. They share health insurance, but that's about it. Of course, there are a few guys around. Billy Joe Bob just hangs around his mom's apartment. He has a couple of kids by different women. He doesn't feel any obligation to support any of them because he doesn't love any of those women or their brats. The courts have decided, after all, that love makes a family. Besides, Billy Joe Bob makes sure he doesn't earn very much money anyhow, so he doesn't have to pay any more. Then there's Luke. Luke got married to Sam when they were both in the military. They thought it would be cool to get some off-base housing. They figured when their tour of duty was up, they'd get divorced and it would all be cool. But then Sam got greedy and decided to sue Luke for his pension. Luke ended up broke and living in this broken down joint. Then there's little Ned. Ned has two mommies and two daddies. I should say he started off with two mommies and two daddies. They quarreled amongst themselves. They went to court over his custody and worked out an elaborate plan for sharing parenting among the four of them. Most of them got tired of being on the cutting edge of social change and lost interest in Ned. He used to cry at school every day because he never knew who was coming to pick him up. Now Ned lives there with his natural mom, Janet. Sometimes one of the fathers or the other mother will come over and demand to see him and take him on an outing, but his story ended pretty well, all things considered, because most of these people pretty much leave him alone now. Then, of course, there's Emily. Emily was bought and paid for by a guy who wanted a little girl. Of course, no one would marry this creeper. So he bought an egg, hired a surrogate, and used his own sperm to have a little girl. The law now says that artificial reproduction is a service, and children are a commodity. Anyone who can pay gets to do anything they want. Anyhow, Emily's teacher figured out that something weird was going on, and she called Child Protective Services. So now Emily lives here with her teacher, Miss Lydia. But she'd lived with her dad, or maybe I should say her manufacturer, for the seven years before anybody stepped in to help her. So you go up the steps to the prayer meeting to Miss Lila's apartment. Not too many people are coming to these prayer meetings anymore. Today it's just Miss Lila, Mrs. Garcia, and old Mr. and Mrs. Villanueva. They used to be very active in Couples for Christ, a worldwide Filipino organization for married couples. But some same-sex couples wanted to join. The organization tried to accommodate them, Christian charity and all that. But those couples didn't feel at home because so many of the Couples for Christ's programs talked about how men and women should treat each other and how they could understand each other and talk to each other. So the same-sex couples sued. The judge made Couples for Christ take out everything that had to do with sex differences. Well, there wasn't much point in the organization after that. Old Mr. and Mrs. Villanueva didn't quite know what to do with themselves. After the organization closed, they had lived and breathed Couples for, for Christ. So Miss Lila brought out the old plaster statue from its hiding place, and everybody brought out their prayer beads. They said their prayers for a while and drank coffee, and you and your grandson left. As you got on the train, you told your grandson, Back in the day, these BART trains used to go all over the place. There aren't too many of them left now. You remember hearing back at the turn of the 21st century how much the government was spending on taking care of kids without their own parents. Back then, it cost the U.S. government the equivalent of the GDP of New Zealand, $112 billion per year. You don't want to think about what it costs today. As you're riding along, your grandson asks you, why is Miss Lila so sad all the time? Well... Her brother used to be the Bishop of Oakland. He's been in jail for the last 10 years, and she's praying for him all the time. Well, why did he go to jail? Well, you know that high school over on Fruitvale Avenue? Sure, Von Walker High School. That used to belong to the Catholic Church. Your grandson's eyes get wide. The church used to have schools? Yeah, that school used to be called St. Elizabeth Ann Seton School. The city tried to tell the bishop that the Catholic schools had to teach stuff that he didn't want to teach. Well, what kind of stuff? Well, like God knew what he was doing when he created men and women as different but equal. Marriages between a man and a woman. Kids need a mom and a dad. Stuff like that. A lot of people started coming to the Catholic schools because they wanted their kids to learn that stuff and nobody else was teaching it. One day the police came to force them to get rid of some books. All the parents came to the school to guard their kids and their books. The bishop blocked the doorway and the police took him away. Some of the parents tried to fight back, but when the police started taking the kids away to put them in foster care, most of the parents gave up. 
The bishop's still in jail. He was one tough guy. He never backed down. A lot of people secretly admire him, but they're afraid to say anything. Oh, you aren't afraid, are you, Grandpa? That's why we go over to Miss Lila's, isn't it? That's right. Grandpappy, you fought for the bishop, didn't you? Long, silent pause. The BART train rattles on. Grandpappy, you didn't do nothing to help the bishop, did you? No, I didn't do nothing. Here's our stop. Let's go watch the Raiders play ball. So you and your son get out of the BART at the end of the line at the crumbling Coliseum, the last remnant of what was once a great civilization. Ladies and gentlemen, this doesn't have to happen. We can show dignity to our brothers and sisters who suffer with same-sex attraction, who struggle with same-sex attraction without taking marriage apart and all the things that will be involved in that. I would encourage you to keep the faith that we're on the right side of history here. I would encourage you to inform yourself, speak up, and show up, show up when the time is right. Be part of your union or your church or your PTA. Go to your school board meetings. Do these things, show up. And together, we can make a difference for natural marriage. Thank you very much. Yeah. So it's customary to take questions at this point? Yes. Um, what would you say the difference is between maybe church uh, instance marriage they might have uh, religious implications and maybe the union that would have some of these, uh, I guess, political speculations? Okay, so the question is what's what would I say is the difference between a church marriage that has religious and theological significance as opposed to a civil union that might have only a civil and social significance. Um, you know what, I I, the, I don't want to take anything away from the theological significance of marriage, but you notice I didn't say anything about that tonight, okay? Um, the, the, it's extremely important from the Christian point of view. That was the meaning of what I said at the very beginning, right? Um, but I think that the distinction people are trying to draw between a civil union and, a, uh, and marriage, I think that's a distinction almost without a difference. For a number, and I think that for a number of reasons, um, that, that society has to have some definition or some understanding of where is the preferred place for sex and childbearing. And that's what we've, we've kind of lost the whole sense of that, right, which is why same-sex marriage is seeming plausible to us now, mm -hmm. right? And so I, I really don't think that distinction buys you very much. The other thing that I would say about it is that it's clear that the radicals on the other side um, don't accept that distinction. And I say that with some confidence because of our experience in California. Um, prior to Prop 8, uh, we, we, had a, we, had a, we had a law that said marriage has to be between a union of a man and a woman. It was legislation, not in the Constitution. But there was a whole series of laws put into place that gave uh, civil domestic partnerships is what they were called there. And they gave, for all practical purposes, all of the practical all the practical problems associated with same-sex couples, they were all solved. Um, the court in the, um, the, in the uh, and um, that was not good enough. See, all the practical problems were solved by that, but that was not good enough for the most radical people. And so they brought forth a lawsuit uh, that was called the in re marriage cases and said this is, separate is not equal, it's discrimination, we want uh, same-sex marriage. So what looked like a compromise wasn't really a compromise, it was a stepping stone. And the court, what was interesting about that is that the court in the pr process of doing the, uh, of gathering information about it, the court said, go find us all the things that are different between same-sex couples and opposite-sex couples under current marriage law. And they came up with a list of things that really honestly nobody had ever heard of and that were really not very significant. So it was, it's like, it was hard to believe that that was really what it, you know, all that was at stake. So I, I honestly think that the, the distinction between the civil union and marriage is not really going to buy anybody anything that they're going to be happy with, you know, so. Yes, sir. You spoke earlier about being similarly situated, and I'm, I'm guessing that you mean that that's what attorneys do to argue from the 14th Amendment, equal protection. You know, if, if that holds, 
you know, if, if they say that men and women are similarly situated, won't women lose a lot of protections also? I'm thinking of the whole argument against women who can't draft women. Um, I think, right, right. I think a lot of that stuff, as far as, okay, oh, uh, sorry, repeat the question. The, the, quest, the question was um, that I, uh, I use the term, um, are same-sex couples and opposite-sex couples similarly situated with respect to the purposes of, of marriage? And you're bringing up the point that are men and women similarly situated? And a lot of that, those questions have already been litigated in some form or fashion as to whether they're similarly situated and therefore uh, can they serve in combat and so on and so forth. And so what's different here in this legal environment is that you're not exactly talking about individuals, you're talking about couples, okay? And so is a same-sex couple and an opposite-sex couple situated similarly? That entails a lot of other beliefs about whether men and women are interchangeable and so on. But from a legal point of view, that's not what they're talking about. And the equality questions about, um, about men and women, a lot of that's already been done. So what, one of the things that came out of this in Ray marriage cases that I just alluded to um, is that, um, that, that the California Supreme Court, when they, um, when they uh, said that the California Constitution requires same-sex marriage, as part of doing that, they said that same-sex same -sex couples are, that, that marriage, that, uh, that gays and lesbians are protected class, and they're protected class at a very high level of scrutiny, okay? That was one of the things built into the case, at a very high level of scrutiny, higher than sex discrimination, so that, so that sexual orientation required more uh, uh, you know, if you're going to distinguish between gays and lesbians and other people, that required a stronger reason than anything you would do with respect to men and women, for example. So there was a lot built into that case that didn't get talked about very much. So as far as levels of scrutiny, they're the same level as race, right? Yes, yes, it, that's exactly correct. That 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 um, that the if that California Supreme Court decision is allowed to stand, what they are basically saying is that sexual orientation should receive the same level of scrutiny as race. That there's no reason, there's, there, there's no reason for anything for them to be treated in any way differently. Yes? Do you know of any case where the offspring of an artificial insemination went to court and said, that guy can agree to give up his right to me in exchange for my mother giving up her right to claim child support, but neither one of them has a right to give up my right to find out who my biological father is in contact with. Okay, so the question is, um, uh, have there been cases of children of donor conception um, as adults coming into court and saying that their parents didn't in fact have the right to contract away some of their rights and responsibilities. And the answer is yeah, that's starting to happen. It's, it's interesting, there are a group of people, they call themselves donor conceived persons, and there are a number of blogs um, out there now that are, um, that are populated by donor conceived persons where they write in about what their experiences are like. Um, there's one called Tangled Web, Tangled Webs, which is about the fact that uh, there's a, a, almost always a lot of lying going on. You know, um, and there, and then there's one that I think it's just called donor conceived persons, and there are a couple of others, um, but in any case, so they're starting to talk amongst themselves about what this experience is like, and some of them are becoming advocates for uh, open records. Um, they're not really in a position to demand child support because usually they're adults, right? If they're old enough to demand open records, it's the whole child support question is moot. So. Um, but, but yeah, they're starting to speak up. I, I mean, that's the bottom line now. Um, and, and what the outcome of that is going to be, I, I don't know. I, I'm in, in sort of email contact with one of these um, uh, people who has started her own blog and who is really adamant that, um, you know, that, that, what is, that what's going on is baby selling, basically. And she didn't like it. <laughs> and, um, and all kinds of people, and she was brought up in Berkeley. This is kind of, just kind of an interesting story. And she was taught by her liberal parents and everything that she should you know, challenge the establishment and all that. And she, and she says to me, you know, and now that I'm challenging the baby sellers, they don't like it. Because of course, what happens in that kind of situation is that the relationship with your mother becomes very t uh, tense. Right, because you, you know, you're saying, well, what do you, I brought you into being, isn't that good enough? Right, and, and the, the 
child is saying, well, you know, I appreciate that, and I love you, and I know you love me, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that. I just think it wasn't right, and I want to know my dad, and I, I wish you hadn't bought half of me. And, you know, all of those kind of complex feelings are very difficult to give voice to inside the family. Um, and so when this young lady, I think she's in her 20s, now that she's starting to talk about it openly, her mom's not happy about it, you know, and, um, and they're taking some flack, and they're taking flack from the industry. You should know, by the way, that the, um, the artificial reproductive technology industry is a big industry, and there's a lot of money involved in that. And, um, you know, let's, let's just close with this thought, because I, I, as I said at the beginning, I care more about marriage than I do about gay issues, okay? So let's just go back to marriage and natural marriage, right? If you get married and stay married, and you um, don't contracept, and you have babies naturally, no one makes any money off of you, okay? No one makes any money off of you. If you get divorced, people make money off of you. If you contracept, you're, you're paying somebody to do stuff to your body. If you have to use artificial reproductive technology, a lot of money changes hands, okay? And this came to my mind because I was looking at a lesbian parenting site and realized that they were being sponsored by uh, an IVF clinic, right? And I'm thinking to myself, well, why can't the Ruth Institute get somebody to sponsor us? And I'm thinking, well, because nobody makes any money off of doing it naturally, you know. And I really think that's the bottom line. No divorce lawyer is going to come on and help me, you know. I mean, that's just that's just the way it is. So, so I'll just leave you all with that thought. And um, thanks for signing up to with our uh, Ruth Institute newsletter. And let me encourage all of you young adults to go to the Ruth Institute website and look at some of the things we have going on. We recently finished a video contest, a film contest, where young adults were answering the question. Uh, what makes lifelong love possible? And there's some very cool, fun videos up there that people made, and so I'd encourage you all to go do that. And if you didn't get a chance to sign up, there's sheets over here. Thanks. Thank you very much.